Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. <coughs> After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And I think our prayer for the preacher, preacher this morning is, is Kathy going to do that? Are you good? There she is. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning. Will you pray with me for the preacher? Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here this morning where we experience your presence as a community. We pray as one voice that you will bless Toby as she honors us by offering the sermon this day. Let her preparations bear fruit as her words reach our ears and our hearts so that we may be good representative disciples for Jesus as we go out from this service with love into the world, our mission field. May you also bless Pastor Terry in her Sabbath leave. Please help her to appreciate the richness of this healing and recuperation time. Please grant this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. In the scripture shared today, we hear about transfiguration and about the desire to live in a place where God's love is abundant. Mark tells us, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. And there he was transfigured before them. So what does it mean to be transfigured? Well, transfiguration refers to a complete change or form or appearance, often from something ordinary into something more beautiful or spiritual. You can imagine a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. That might be a good example of transfiguration. When Jesus was transformed, his clothes became dazzling white, and suddenly he was among others who exemplified the best of God's people. Elijah and Moses. For a moment, God's love in its purest form was made visible to Peter, James, and John. The disciples' reaction demonstrated two important things. First, they were able to comprehend the experience for what it was. They re recognized what it meant to be in the presence of God's pure light. Secondly, they wanted to stay in that place. They wanted to build houses for Jesus, Elijah, and Moses, and to live among them. They wanted to live in God's pure light, in his pure love. When the clouds descended upon the group and God's voice was heard, Jesus was declared to be God's beloved son and worthy to be listened to. The clouds lifted and it was Jesus alone who stood with the disciples. Jesus embodied the experience of being in God's pure love. The group returned down the mountain to go about their daily routines, returning to the life they knew. But the disciples understood more profoundly who Jesus was, and perhaps they had a newfound knowledge of what was to come. What they had witnessed could not be unseen or unexperienced. I imagine the memory reshaped how they thought for the rest of their lives. 
Have you ever had a transformative experience that shifted how you live your life? If so, were you looking for it, or did it just sort of happen? I think that we each had the opportunity to act in ways that show God's love and create experiences that transform each other's lives. However, to understand them, it's important to recognize the experiences as they happen. And I think it's important to search for ways to live in God's love, to give others the love that God puts in our hearts, and to receive the love of God from others when they offer it. It reminds me of an experience I had a few years ago when I spent a week in the hospital. I met a few people in particular who showed me God's love in everyday actions, and they helped to make the hospital experience transformative in my life. A funny thing happened the very first night there. I found myself awake at three in the morning in considerable discomfort and needing to find a better position than laying flat on a hospital bed. A chair sat in the corner of the room directly across from the main door. I pulled myself out of bed and grabbed my IV drip hole, which my, name, my kids had named Perry, by the way. I stepped cautiously over to the chair where I decided to sit for as long as I could remain upright. About a half an hour later, the night nurse came by, backing into the room as they all did because they wheeled a cart with a computer, a screen, a monitor, and other items necessary to perform periodic checks on their patients. She stopped dead in her tracks when she got to the bed, and her face registered confusion, followed quickly by fear. The bed was empty, after all. From the dark corner of the room, directly behind her, I said, I'm over here. She jumped and wheeled around with a look of shock and surprise. She grabbed her chest and exclaimed, you scared the heck out of me. I burst out laughing. I couldn't help myself. She laughed in relief. Over the next hour and a half between patients and other calls on her beeper, we got to know each other. We shared life experiences and we laughed a lot more. We began a relationship because she gifted me precious moments of her time. And with that gift, my faith that everything was going to be all right was restored. When you're in the hospital for any length of time and expected to have limited mobility, it's not unusual to be given a medication to prevent the buildup of blood clots in your legs. For me, the medication was heparin and it was administered by injection every eight hours. The needle was given in my abdomen, which was not feeling very good. And I really hate needles. So by Wednesday morning, I was feeling like those medicines might be doing more harm than good, and really, I had had enough of getting shots. But I wasn't the doctor or the nurse. I was just the patient. So it took a lot of nerve, but I finally asked if I could skip the injections. The nurse seemed surprised. I don't think she was used to being asked not to administer medicines when they're prescribed by the doctor. I reasoned with her that I hadn't really been flat out on the bed very, very much anyway. In fact, I'd spent hours wandering around the hospital floor in the middle of the night because it was so uncomfortable to be lying down. Along the way, I studied the architecture and the plants and how things got together, looking at other people and other things, anything to keep my mind occupied when sleep was elusive. The nurse looked at me. I think she finally saw desperation in my eyes. I really didn't want another needle. She paused and considered everything, and to my surprise, she agreed with me. She said she'd skip that shot this time because I was pretty mobile. She couldn't pr promise that I'd be so lucky the next time, but this time, I was safe. She smiled. I smiled. And in that moment, as she considered my wishes, she gifted me moments of her time. She really listened to me. She allowed our interaction to help make a decision that made me feel like I was more than just a patient and she the nurse. Her gift of time gave me a renewed sense of hope that I was actually in control of something. In a week where everything seemed out of my control, my body, 
my food, my sleep, my situation in general, she helped me believe in me again. On Friday morning, I was scheduled for yet another CT scan to determine if anything had changed in my condition. I already had a CT scan and multiple ultrasounds when I was admitted on Monday. I really hoped that the TT CT scan would be clear and I could go home. The transport person came and took me by wheelchair to the radiology department on a different floor. The CT scan was completed and I waited for transport personnel to take me back to my room. I was carefully tucked in an alcove out of the busy hallway to wait. As I head through the week, I found myself talking to none other than Perry, my IV drip. A few minutes later, I could suddenly hear an elderly woman being wheeled into another room in the radiology department. I couldn't see her, but I could hear her moaning. She complained about various ailments. Her head hurt, her stomach was not feeling right. She needed more medicine, but she thought the medicine was making her sick. She spoke to herself because no one was able to be with her as they prepared to give her tests. My heart filled with compassion. What she wanted most of all, I thought to myself, was someone to come to her, to talk to her, to recognize her as a fellow human being who had valid concerns worth doing something about. She wanted to know that she mattered to someone. Unfortunately, I couldn't go to her. I wasn't in a position to even really have a conversation with her. I didn't know when our caretakers would return, and I didn't want to disturb everyone by calling out into the hallway. A few minutes later, the transport person came and returned me to my room. As I entered through the doorway, I was surprised to see the entire room had been remade from top to bottom. Everything was put in place. The bedding had been replaced with new linens and the remnant bits of, of paper and trash that it had accumulated on my side table were gone. My pillow was waiting and placed invitingly at the head of the bed, beckoning me to take a nap. And the little stuffed puppy that my youngest son had brought to keep me company was placed carefully on the pillow, looking for all the world like he would jump into my lap the moment I got to the bed. I was overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude. My nurse, and really I considered them all my nurses by then, had taken time to reset my perspective. By gifting me precious minutes of her time, when I wasn't even there to acknowledge her or her gift, she reminded me that there are a million ways to show that we care for others. Her love for her job, her patience, and especially in that moment, me, was ever, evident everywhere I looked. I remembered the women I'd heard down the hallway, and I prayed she too had nurses who showed her this love. As I look back over that week, a week that could have been utter misery, I know I'm fortunate to be able to say it was a pretty good week. Despite pain, frustration, and the fear of not knowing exactly what was going on, I laughed a lot, probably more than I deserved. I had an amazing hospital staff caring for me. I was reminded that if we look for them, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. Over the course of my hospital stay, I had time to ponder what's important in my life and what's important in the life of others. Most importantly, time was gifted to me by others who regularly put the concerns and needs of their patients before themselves. I was given the gift of time by people who live in ways that I believe Jesus would have them live. Time was gifted to me in love. The seemingly simple gift of spending time with others can restore faith in the midst of tribulation, offer hope for a better future, and demonstrate the everlasting power of love. Don't underestimate the gift of time, especially time gifted to us here on earth by God. Perhaps my hospital stay cannot be considered a transfiguration moment, but it certainly was transformative for me. I began to look more earnestly for the myriad of ways that others demonstrate God's love for me and ways that I could use the gifts that God has bestowed upon me to help others. 
I think more about what it means to listen to Jesus. I recognize more often the, time, the times when I'm in the presence of God's pure light. We each have mountains to climb in order to be in the presence of God. May you share your journey with Jesus, the greatest guide you'll ever have. I pray for each of you moments of transformation and an ever deeping, deeper understanding of transfiguration. Thanks be to God. Amen. Um.